Well, we're in Revelation chapter 5 today. We've been going through the book of Revelation, and today we find ourselves in Revelation 5. Uh, you might remember back in chapter 1, if you don't remember, if you weren't here, chapter 1, it starts out, Revelation 1, verse 1, says a revelation of Jesus Christ, and we talked about that, and it's a revelation that's about Jesus Christ, as well as it's from Jesus Christ. It's from the uh, throne room in heaven of God the Father that gave it to Jesus. The revelation went from Jesus to an angel, from an angel to John, from John to the, uh, what, we, what we discussed was the pastors of churches in the area. Those were real churches. The seven churches in Revelations chapter 2 and 3 were real churches with real uh, concerns. They, have, they were learning uh, as we are today, 2000, some 2,000 years later, how to walk more closely with the Lord. Last week we looked at, uh, and, and then we mentioned that how, how horrific it would be for God to send us a letter that said, Autumn Creek Baptist Church, you're doing this okay, you're doing this okay, but I have this against you. And as a pastor of a church, I, that, would, that would probably put me in fear of somebody that powerful and my Lord and my Savior. It would both be a, a heartache that we weren't following perfectly as the best of our ability, and also uh, it would probably put me in a little fear if he says, but I hold this against you. And I will come to you quickly. We talked one of those churches when it said, I will come to you quickly. It was not a, hey, I'm coming quickly. It was, I'm coming. You ever was a little kid when your mom, wait till your dad gets home. Yeah. Well, if it was my birthday, wait till your dad gets home. It's your birthday and we're having a celebration. And I'm happy about that. I broke a window and I back talked my mom. And she says, wait till your father gets home. And I wasn't happy. Same words, but radically different meaning. Well, that's why in Revelation, when we read Revelation and we study Revelation as Christians, we rejoice. Man, it's coming, it's coming to the end. It's, it's made our, our troubles and our trials and our uh, persecutions and our being persecuted here on earth, it makes it all worth it because we know the reward is coming. As a matter of fact, one of the scriptures says, I'm coming and I'm bringing my reward, your reward with me. Who's ready for that day when Christ calls the church up and says, I have your rewards. You've well done, good and faithful servant. And I've told you I've said that before. When I get there, I don't want... I, I'm happy if the Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, but I want Jesus to say, well done, Ross. Man, you hit it. You nailed it, baby. You got it. You want, I want Jesus to be excited. I want, okay, Dale, you... you <laughs> I don't want that. I want, I want when, I, when I'm there, the Lord to be excited and, and, and good job and a pat on the back. And I want to say, God, I had everything I had. I gave, I gave everything I knew to give. Forgive me where I held back. Forgive me where I didn't have you on the throne. We talked about chapter 4 last week about there was one sitting on the throne and how we have to contend with that daily as believers, knowing the book. We still have to say, is there one on the throne of my heart? Or do I sometimes push Jesus out of the way and sit up on that throne? Sometimes, if you're honest, I think you have to say there's times you do things. You say, probably shouldn't be doing this, but I'm on the throne right now. You can't be on the throne. He's on the throne. Very specific, there is one who is on the throne. And so that gets to chapter 5 today. Uh, and the, in chapter 5 uh, starts, I'm going to read here, verse 1, chapter 5 of Revelation. If anyone needs a Bible, we have some Bibles back there. I know there's uh, Daniel back there, Stu, a couple other folks. If you need a Bible, slip your hand up. They'll get you a Bible uh, over to you. Or if you see someone next to you that doesn't have a Bible, you might want to let them read along with you. In uh, chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 1 says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look upon it. We're going to stop there for just a minute in those first four verses. Uh, there was one on the throne. God the Father is sitting on the throne as he sees this. You can read, and I think it's Daniel chapter 12. Uh, I think, I'm, not, I'm going to be very careful. I'll parse my words here. Daniel, I think it's Daniel 12 where it says Daniel saw uh, a vision of one standing in linen. He had a scroll. Daniel read the scroll. It said, seal up the scroll until the end times. That could possibly be this scroll. It was sealed up. The man in linen, I do believe, again, is, uh, was a, uh, 
Christ, Christophany, where Christ Jesus came in the flesh probably prior to his being born. Maybe not in the flesh, but in the spirit, but visible in the physical realm, or certainly visible to Daniel. I, I kind of believe that might have been an angel of the Lord or possibly Jesus. We're not, doesn't define that, so it doesn't tell us exactly. So I want to be careful with saying it was something, but I'll give you what the probably best options are. I believe it was Jesus that had that scroll, because who would be worthy to, we're going to see here in a moment, who's worthy to undo the scroll? Well, I think Jesus was the one that was able to seal the scroll. But in any event, we see this uh, book. Your, your, your translation might say book. It might say, I saw one in heaven who had a, a book. Uh, possibly yours says that. It might say a scroll. This NIV, I think, says book. New American NASB says book. The words biblion is the Greek word, and that it was a, where we get our word Bible, uh, there's a city in Lebanon called Biblos, where the Phoenicians made the alphabet, and that's, where, again, where we get that word Biblion. And Kelly, uh, and, and, uh, and anyway, Kelly was giving me a sign. I thought it was a sign. She was just doing something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, uh, so whether it says book or scroll, at that time, they don't know there was really books in the form that we have today. So, but the point is, there was some instrument that had writing on it, both inside and outside. Uh, and, and that scroll was written inside and outside. It said that if a scroll was written on the inside and the outside, it would have been rolled up. And most scrolls, uh, if you can imagine, I'm sure you've got a vision of them, it said there was writing on both sides of it. Well, those kind of scrolls from years ago mainly had writing on the inside. If there was writing on the back side of it, uh, it would have been, they had a lot to say or we know from uh, archaeology and from other extra-biblical uh, sources that sometimes if Daniel, let's say Daniel and I had a contract, and we put a contract in here, and we said we want this to be followed upon such and such a date, and we'd put a string around it, and we'd probably two if it was between us, and we'd put some wax on that string, and he'd have a signet that he would press it, and I'd have a signet. And it would say, if anything ever broke or a signet was broken, we'd say, I see wax there, but that's not my mark. Someone's opened this. We know someone's looked at it. Well, some of these contracts, there would be things on the outside of the paper also. Could you imagine having 100 pieces of paper rolled up with seals on them you can't open? How would you know which was which? If someone's, go get me the book of Isaiah. Can't tell. So sometimes they would write on the outside a brief description of what was on the inside. So we don't know that again, but when it says it was written here on the inside and the outside... It's one of two things. It was a brief description of what was inside the scroll as it was opened, or it was, there was a lot to be said, and they used both sides of the scroll. I only point that out because it would be unusual. Uh, there, there were certain things they would do those, and it wasn't very common. So we're talking about, again, 2,000 years ago, our brains don't think this way, but 2,000 years ago, if someone said there was a scroll written inside and outside, it was either the stuff in that scroll is very important or there's a lot to say, or both. The book of Revelation, what do you think? I'm going to say it's very important, and there's a lot. And their mindset 2,000 years ago, that would have keyed them in on what's about to be said is important, and there's a lot of it. So that's what's going on there in that verse 2. Who, uh, verse 1, it had writing on the inside and the outside. It had seven seals. Seven would be the perfect complete, that number seven. We're, we mentioned when we first started Revelation, we're going to see that number a lot in the book. The seven spirits, the seven churches, the seven lampstands, the seven seals. Now we're at that point, we're talking about these seven seals. And he said, they saw a strong angel. This could be like an archangel. I'll tell you right now, angels are strong. I don't know how strong they are, but they're strong. We know Old Testament, there was a war going on. One angel went in and wiped out 185,000 of the enemy in one night. So I don't know how strong this angel is, but when it says, look, this wasn't just an angel, it was a strong angel. I do believe there are uh, systems uh, in heaven. You know, a lot of you know Dwight was in the Marine Corps, and maybe some others served in the military as well. A, a, a five-star general is rare, but they do have them. Four-star generals are around. Captains, they have these different levels. And we see in Daniel, I tell you that today, it's not really here specifically in the passage we're looking at today, but remember Daniel was praying and the angel came and said, the Lord has heard your prayers for these 21 days of prayer and fasting, and I couldn't beat the prince of Persia, I couldn't get through, but God sent Michael to help me. Well, I do think there's levels and powers in God's system of authority that there's also angels that have different strengths and weaknesses, and I think that's also correct here because we say it says, 
I saw a strong angel. If they were all equal strength, I don't think he'd make that adjectival point there. But he said, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. I can't imagine what was going on in John's brain. He's in heaven. He's seeing the elder. He's seeing the throne set up. He's seeing God the Father sitting on the throne. He sees a rainbow, lightning, thunder, the noise of 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 angels, a voice like rushing water, like a wind, like a cacophony of noise. And then he says, he hears this loud angel over all that, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. An angel come out and says, with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? So they have this scroll now in the hand, sitting in the hand of the one on the throne, God the Father, has a scroll with seven seals on it, holding it in his right hand, and the angel calls out, the world is, uh, the, the, it's, they would have criers or people that, you ever remember the old TV shows, uh, King Arthur and different things, someone would come into the city and open a scroll and say, oh, the king is coming, or they'd cry something out. This is that karux, K-E-R-U-X, it's that same word here in Greek, which was someone would be a town crier. They would call out information from the king. And that's what this uh, angel's doing. He says, he cried out with a loud voice, who is worthy? All of creation, here's this call. Who is worthy to open God's final will and testament? God's final end of when time ends, who's worthy to open these seals and these scrolls? From John's perspective of the Old Testament, he would know that God's final will, he would have had the the prophets of Jeremiah and Daniel and these other Ezekiel and said there's a day coming when God's going to give and reveal more information to us about the Messiah that's coming. And as we get that information about the Messiah that's coming and, and that information is in this scroll, it's in this sealed up book and the angel cries out, who is worthy? And they look through all heaven. They look on the earth. They look under the earth. They look in the seas and everything that's in them. And the report comes back on this search looking for who is worthy to open the seals. And verse 3, probably in all this glory of heaven and the vision that John's seeing, no one in heaven or on earth. It doesn't say in my Bible that Michael stood up and said, I'm able. Gabriel didn't stand up and say, I'm able. Daniel, Abraham, Adam, Job, Moses... All the dead, all those in heaven, on the earth, under the earth. They went everywhere looking for someone worthy to open the scroll. Nobody was worthy. And in that interim time, as the report comes back in verse 3 that says, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Not saying that this passage from their mindset Again, 2,000 years ago, I always try to put us in their minds of what they were hearing and what their understanding was. It helps us today to know contextually, historically, what the message is. But they would have wills. I said earlier, if Daniel and I, let's say we have a business together, and uh, we make uh, Brother Jim the executor of our will, and both of us die, and in this scroll, we put our seals on it, and we say on the outside that only Jim, Rich, is able to open these seals, and they're looking... My family, your family is looking, well, dad's gone and the business is here and, 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 and what happens? And they say, well, who's able? Who's got the authority? Who has the authority and the ability to execute? We use that word today, uh, the executor of the will. Who can not only open it and read it, but who gets to declare what is right and what is wrong? Who gets to declare what's right and wrong in God's will? Not only, I don't mean God's will like he's dying. I mean God's word. Yeah, which, which human being, which demonic power, which dead person, which live person, which angelic being and all creation has the authority to break these seals and start reading? And the report comes back, no one. And John, verse 4, gets caught up in the humanity and the desire of God. How can a sinful man stand before a holy God? And, and you're going to send us information about how this the new covenant of Jeremiah. You told Jeremiah the prophet there would be a new covenant. And in this scroll is the new covenant in there. I want to stand in front of God righteous, but I'm a sinner and I know it. Who can open this and read it to me? Who can tell me what's right and what's wrong and how it can be right and what the end results are going to be? And John, when he hears the message, no one. 
No one. Then I began to weep greatly. Yours might say I began to weep and weep. It's the, the, there's two different words there for crying. One word was John 11:35, where it says Jesus wept. That was a, a crying. I'm sure we've all done this. We've all cried quietly. And that's that, that one word in, where it says Jesus wept, that's the one place that's used in the Bible. It was a quiet crying. This one, though, is a word that's more common. It says, with sobbing and wailing. He wasn't just, you know, wiping his eyes and sad. He was, oh, God, what's wrong? What do you mean there's no one? Just, he just his, his emotional sadness just overtook him, that there was no one worthy. And he was caught up in the cry of all humanity, God, I love you, I want you, but I can't come in your presence. Who, who can fix this problem? Who can read the scroll? Who can tell me your word? The next step. And it says that he began to cry greatly because no one, no one was found worthy to open the book or even to look upon it. Boy, that's just got to be a horrible situation. If you understand who God is and who you are, someone the other day, I was talking this week to someone they were saying, well, the Bible doesn't say this, the Bible doesn't say that, and the Bible doesn't tell me about... And I said, guys, the book, the Bible is not a geography or a science book. It's a spiritual book. And the point of the Bible is to say, who is God, who are we, and what is our relationship with Him? That's the point of the Bible. In the book, there happens to be geographical information that 100% of the time has been proven true. There's some basic scientific information in the Bible. And 100% of the time, it's been true, proven true. Isaiah, when he said, he that sits on the circle of the world. How did Isaiah know the world was a circle or a globe? I don't know, but he knew it. There's too much evidence in the Bible to say it's true that you have to say, if you're not a skeptic, if you say, I'm coming to look for truth, if you read it, you'll find it's true. If you're at home today and you're struggling with it, I would encourage you, call our church. There's people here, men, women, lots of folks that would be happy to step by step walk you through the truths found in this Bible, in this book. There is no truth other than this, God's Word. And ultimately, that written Word became the living Word found in Jesus Christ. So he begins to weep, and one of the elders, remember there was the four living creatures circling the throne, and there was 24 elders, and we talked about that a little last week, possibly the 12 tribes of Israel, possibly with the 12 apostles of the New Testament. So all the church, both Old Testament and New Testament, there, we don't know for a fact who these 24 elders are. We talked about that a little last week in chapter 4. But in any event, 24 elders are there on thrones. And it says, one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. And it's a, it's a command. He puts in the command, stop that. He says, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome. So as to open the book and it's seven seals. Hallelujah is right. Who said that? Hallelujah. There is one worthy. All of you, all, John breaking down, crying with sobbing, wailing. Who was, did John ever see Jesus in the flesh? Yeah. He was very personal to him. He's like, Lord, you said you'd come back 60 years ago. I, supposedly, his extra biblical source said he was burned in oil. They couldn't kill him. Rome did everything they couldn't kill him. Finally said, let's send him off to an island and and uh, exile him so he just shuts up. We don't have to hear his message anymore. Does anyone know who the Caesar was when John was exiled? I don't. Do we still know the words of John? <laughs> the world tried to shut him up, and look what happened. Yeah. One of the most popular books in the world is the Bible, and one of the most popular books in the Bible is the Revelation. I hear, hear that all the time. So in any event, he says, stop crying. The lion from Judah. And we see that way back in Genesis 49, where Jacob, the father of Israel, the 12 tribes, is blessing his children. And he says, Judah, from you a lion's whelp, a lion's cub will come. There'll be one on the throne that will be like a lion. That was pr predicted way back in Genesis 49, when J uh, Jacob was blessing his children. And when he got to Judah, he said, you're a lion. So this says, from the, a lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and I can't imagine as John is standing there in the throne room and seeing this, and he's wailing and he's crying, and he hears a crying. There is a lion that's going to open that. Think of a lion. You ever been to the zoo and seen a lion? You ever been down, is it Houston Zoo that has that one plexiglass where it's like the lion comes up and the lion's as tall as you are? 
I, I, they're huge. They're big. They're scary. There's a, I think it's the zoo. You can walk up, and the lion will come up to that window sometimes, and the window's probably about this high. And he, I look, and like, man, he's looking right in my eyes. He could probably eat me and, well, me, probably about seven bites, but, <laughs> so, so, nor, you know, but he, they're big. And, and all the imagery of a lion and the power of a lion, and, you know, we might get into, well, an elephant's stronger than it, but who's called the king of beasts is a lion. And I can't, he's probably saying this, elder says, stop, look, there's a lion from the tribe of Judah. He's, he's thinking all the ferocity and the power and the strength of a lion. And he looks to look for this giant lion that has unlimited power. In verse 5, and he gets to verse 6 and he says, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures, the elders, a lamb. Hey, you said a lion. <laughs> Anyone ever had sheep or lamb? Lambs, little baby lambs? They're scared to death of everything. They're scared of their shadows. Be walking by and a lamb will look down and see a shadow and jump. You know, it's like, this lamb? What are you talking about, a lamb? I'm looking for a lion. That was the problem with the Jews 2,000 years ago. We're looking for a king to come in on a white horse and with an army and wipe out the Roman Empire. They weren't looking for a meek and mild savior. And sometimes we're like that. We got to remember who Jesus is. He's both, yes, he's a lamb, he's also a lion. First time he came as a lamb. Guess what he's coming back as next time? He's coming back as a lion. If you're not ready, today is the day of salvation. Get ready today. Well, I'll do it next Sunday. I'll do it. My birthday's in August. I'll do it. No. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised today. You may, some of us may not. I know you say it's crazy. Some of us may not get home today and go to bed with our head on the pillow. We're not promised anything. Here's what we're promised. While you're alive, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what we're promised. So he looks and sees this lamb, and it says the lamb is standing as though it were slain. And what it's saying here is he sees this lamb that's got all the marks of a slaughtered lamb, a slain lamb, a, a lamb that was uh, Arion. It's not only the word lamb, but it's you're, you're, some of your translations might say a lamb kin or a baby lamb or a young lamb. There's a word for a, a lamb. There's also a word for a baby lamb. They use the word, he saw a baby lamb, a little lamb, slain with marks as though it had been just ripped apart and slaughtered and put as a sacrifice. And, and the, it says it's seen this, uh, and, and the, the verb it has here, this word slain, it's in the tense of something that happened in the past, but it has effects still enduring and ongoing effects in the present. Uh, if I said Kelly and I were married in 1990, there's still effects from that day. It, you, I'm not gonna go, we're not doing English here, but if you said it has been slain or it had been slain, it has the verb tense that means it, here it happened back here and it's still going on today. It has effects today. Aren't you glad that salvation, what happened 2,000 years ago at Calvary, has effects today? Amen. When, that, when it says anyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, why? Because 2,000 years ago, something happened. And that, you're telling me that sacrifice from 2,000 years ago was still good today? The effects of what happened 2,000 years ago is still effective today. Amen. Last week, I said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. That blood is incorruptible. It's eternal. It lasts forever. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Anyone. But I'm a sinner. I have evil thoughts. I have improper relationships. I cheated on my spouse. I'm not a good parent. I'm a drunk. I'm alcohol. I'm, a, I'm an addict. I'm a, Jesus loves you. He wants to cover you. He wants you in his family. Don't let any of your sins stop you from thinking that blood won't cover them. The blood of Jesus Christ will cover every sin. One sin it won't. I reject the gift. The impardonable sin is the rejection of salvation. If you reject and say, I want nothing to do with the blood, I want nothing to do with Jesus, that's what gets you in hell. All you got to do is say, and you don't even got to know much. So often we talk about that thief on the cross, looks over Jesus and says, remember me. Jesus isn't listening to the physical words, he's looking at the heart. And if you don't even know the words, if you're here or you're at home or you're watching the future, you say, I don't know the words, I don't know, what do I got to say? Believe. For by grace are you saved through faith. Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again. Forgive me, a sinner. Something that simple. You say it with the right heart attitude, boom. All 
your past, present, and future sins are forgiven. And guess what? You know how much Jesus loves us? He loves us enough not to leave us in the shape he found us. He's going to start working on us. And he who began a good work in us will continue to perfect it until the day he returns. He's not only going to save, give us salvation, he's going to start a process of sanctification in us. And you might, right here, I bet we could go till the Lord returns with, you know, back when I was 15, I did this. Today, I have no desire at all. At 20, I did this. I have no desire. Two years ago, I was involved in this stuff. Today, I don't even, it, it has no hold over me. What broke all those chains? The chain breakers who broke those chains. Satan had you in slavery. You couldn't get out of your sins. You might, I, I've had several people I've worked with over the years say, I, wanna, I, want, I don't want this, whatever it is, to control me, but it does. There is no human answer. No amount of psychology, no amount of pills, no amount of therapy. The only therapy that breaks some of that stuff is Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a salvation problem. It's not a physical problem. It's a salvation problem. If you don't get that right, it's so hard to get the other stuff right. So he looks at this lamb that was slain, having seven horns. And again, that's the seven horns. That's power. The seven is perfect. Seven horns is well throughout Scripture listed as a, a, a thing of power. We see this beast that had seven horns, but that beast couldn't hold the seven horns. He couldn't hold the power. Th this lamb said it has seven horns. I believe that's saying it was all-powerful. And he had seven eyes, and I believe that he's all-knowing. He sees everything. Aren't you glad God sees everything at one time? And aren't you glad Jesus only gives you one day at a time? Because some of us says, man, I couldn't handle two days at a time. If God gave me all the problems of two days in one day, it, it, I'd blow up. I have enough problems today. Lord, just get me to bed tonight at, you know, one in, tomorrow morning at one o'clock so I can go to sleep for four or five hours before the next set of problems start again. Give me a little break. God, you know, God, God sees everything at once, but he gives it to us just a little at a time. As a matter of fact, it says be anxious for, what should we be anxious for? Yeah, it says today's got its own problems. Tomorrow you got another set of problems. Don't worry about that. Just, just worry about today. Get through today, one day at a time, one step at a time. I'll get you there. Jesus isn't up in heaven necessarily looking down at us, not aloof or distant. Jesus is walking alongside of us. Jesus, in the, if you're tired, you're weary, you're, come take my yoke. Not my reins. You know, some of you know we have horses, and you put a horse in a rein, you get a lot more control when it's bitten its mouth. Jesus didn't say, come over here and I'll stick a bit in your mouth and I'll control you. And I'll hit you with a stick if you don't do what I want. He says, come over and get in the yoke with me. I'll pull the wagon with you. Wow, that's, that's way better than a bit in the mouth. Some of those horses will try to spit the bit. They don't want it. Do we ever do that? I don't want, Lord, I don't want that discipline. I was down here praying a little bit ago, Lord, thank you for loving me enough to give me discipline. Thank you for discipline. Thank you for sanctification. Thank you for... So this lamb that's standing as though it's slain with all power and all knowing everything at once and the seven spirits of God that are sent out to all the earth. Seven uh, says, He came and He took the book out of the right, hand, or the right hand of Him who sat on the throne. God the Father's on the throne. He has this book. And every other creature that goes around the throne drops and kneels, falls down on their face and starts worshiping. But this lamb walks right up as, as though there's a relationship between them already. As though he knows him. You know, sometimes, some of you have been with me before where, you know, I've said this. I said, folks, I apologize. I'm sorry, but if I'm in a meeting or I'm talking to somebody, if my wife or one of my two daughters calls me, folks, I'm sorry. This is my daughter. I got to take it. But we're in a business. We're in this. We're in that. We're in, sorry. If they call me, I'm going to respond instantly. If I, if I see they call me, they only call me usually when there's a problem. <laughs> so, so if they're calling me, there might be a problem. And as much as I care about what we're talking about, this is my child. So when Jesus Christ goes to the Father and says, Father, forgive Dale. You know, I always forget that one time we've told the story where we were in Spain and our little one we thought was abducted. We couldn't find it for a couple hours. I remember dropping down and saying, God, I don't care what you're doing. Stop and listen. <laughs> I know that sounds irre irreverent. It wasn't meaning to be irreverent at the time. But it was, God, i got to have your undivided attention. I've got a problem. I don't care who else in the world has a problem. i got a problem. And I need you to focus on my problem right now. 
Do you know God is always focused on all your problems all the time? I give you that story from 15, 16 years ago just because it so stayed with me that I can always hear God saying, Dale, do you not think I know everything all at once? I've got seven eyes. I see everything. I'm aware of everything all at one time. I'm fully aware of your problems. You don't have to come to me with that, with will you listen to me? Of course I'll listen. I'm, I'm, I'm your father. You're a joint heir with my son, Jesus Christ. Of course I'm listening. What, what's up? Well, Rachel's mad. Well, we, I know that. She's okay. Well, God, I got to figure it out. I already know, I already know the end before it, you knew the beginning. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He sees it all at once. And everything's under his power and his authority. So, Autumn Creek, be anxious for nothing. We just got to just... Do you know what we're only called to do? Obey. And what's the hard thing to do? Obey. <laughs> but we got the Holy Spirit with it. So he said he went up, this uh, slain, this lamb that was walking and living... And, and brought back from the sacrifice. You know, that was a lamb that was slain as though it was slain, it was, it was given as a sacrifice. It's walking and moving around and fully alive. It's almost as though it was dead and came back to life. Well, guess what? 1 Corinthians 15 says he was buried for your sins. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's who this lamb is. When he had taken the book of the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp, and a golden bowl full of incense was the prayers of the saints. You know, I was reading uh, the other day, and uh, I think it was in Luke's gospel, with Zechariah and Elizabeth when they had the child, and they were in their 90s, and uh, John the Baptist was born. And uh, the angel, amazingly, the angel tells Zechariah, God's, God has your prayers. Your prayers have gone up to him. He knows. I like this verse here that says, these elders have, in the, uh, they have golden bowls. Each one has a harp, a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. You know when you pray, God never forgets that prayer? God, help my grandchild going through the situation. A hundred million years from today, God knows that prayer. He doesn't lose it. We said, well, I said this prayer like 10 years ago. God, maybe you forgot. They're continually rising up. They're held in place. And so when, when that angel goes to Zechariah with the, his uh, John the Baptist, he said, Zechariah, your prayers are before the Father. Well, he's 90 now. What do you think Zechariah was praying for his son? In his 80s? 70s? 60s? 50s? Maybe back in his 20s and 30s. I got a feeling sometime along the way he kind of maybe quit praying that. I want, a, I want a son. I want a son. I want a son. So this prayer might have been 50 years earlier, Zechariah, back when you were in your 30s and you said, Lord, give me a son. God heard him. He's, he's not forgotten. He, in, these, these beings are keeping your prayers in his presence. He's aware of them. He sees everything at one time. So to us, as I prayed that 10 years ago, God said, I got it right here in front of me right now. What are you talking about? I've got that prayer right in front of me right now. I got that prayer. It's not old prayer to me. It's a present prayer to me. I don't forget. How many of us, if your child came up to you, your son or daughter, and said, Dad, I'm hungry. Mom, I'm hungry. Who would give them a, a live serpent? Who would give them a snake? Nobody. Dad, I'm, I, could you give me a piece of bread? Here's a rock. Well, guess what? If we're sinful beings, how much more our Father in heaven that loves us when we ask for something says, I'll give you more than you asked for. I'll give you more, better. I has not seen nor ear heard the things God has in store for his chosen ones. That's the God we serve. So when you, if the devil gets in your brain and starts saying, well, God doesn't answer your prayers. Whoa, 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 devil. We're not at the end yet. You just wait. You just sit tight and wait because I know where you're headed and I know where I'm headed, devil. So let's just wait to the end of this matter and see what happens. Because I serve a righteous king. I serve a righteous judge. I serve the king of kings and the lord of lords. And you ain't it, devil. Verse 9, it says, And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and you were purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and every tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom your translation might say, you've made them to be kings and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. We just sang that a little bit ago. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. 
to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven. Are the angels created? Was the devil created? Every created being one day is going to fall down. Everything created which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, everything in heaven, on heaven, in the earth, on the earth, under the earth, in the earth, in under the earth, on the sea, under the sea, in the sea. I can't think of any other places. <laughs> That's pretty much everywhere. Everything, every created being that ever was and ever exists today and ever will be everywhere is one day heard them say to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. So sometimes when the devil comes along and you're praising the Lord, he's, oh, quit praising. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. Hey, devil, one day you're going to be praising with me. One day we're going to be, I'm going to look right you right in the eye and say, I remember that day you told me to quit praising. What are you doing now? Here's the devil. To him who sits on the throne and the land, blessing and honor and glory forever and ever and ever and dominion forever. The devil's going to be saying that one, one day. So when he comes and tells you quit, hey, devil, you're going to start. Trust me. It says right here in Revelation 5, 13. Let me, let me give you some scripture, devil. I got a feeling you start talking to the devil like that, you start throwing scripture, guess what he's going to do? I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm gone. He will flee from you. We read these words, but we, gotta, we can't just get deep in the word. We need the word to get deep into us. And use that sword of the Lord. And when the devil's attacking you, you let him know who you are. Hey, I'm in a kingdom. I'm a high royal priesthood. It says here, I'm a priest of the living, the living, the living God. Devil, you dare approach me? How, you know, do you know who you're talking to? Now, now to have that boldness, you got to be on the right path. You can't be a Christian over here in this mess and telling the Satan you don't control over me because he does have control over you. But you got to use that Holy Spirit within you and say, no. Do you all believe we're in spiritual warfare? I tell so many people, and I've said this a couple months ago, if you walk around with the helmet of salvation and nothing else, you're going to get beat up on a battlefield. You better have the breastplate and the belt and the shoes and the sword. Because if you walk around just with a helmet on a battlefield, you're going to get chewed up. And a lot of people do that. Well, I'm saved, so I'm going to heaven, so I don't need to do anything else. You're, that's going to be a tough walk, tough road. So the four living, and, and then I put here in my notes here when I closed, I was thinking about this this week. I'm sure you've heard this thought before, but basically Jesus Christ has taken back dominion. Who did, who did God the Father in Genesis give dominion to? He told Adam and Eve, you will have dominion over the earth. Every creature, being, everything that walks, everything that creeps. And when Satan came along and said, give me that dominion, we gave it to him. We said, okay, I'm not going to listen to the voice of the Lord. I'm going to listen to the voice of the devil. We being humanity. Mankind. And we listened to the voice of the devil. And we gave over him. And we know through the Bible, it says the present power that rules this world, the dark powers. There, I wish we had more time, but there's so much Old Testament stories of... Uh, in places where the Israel was taken out of the land in Babylon, they came back 100 years later. By the time they came back, their family fields and homes, other people were living in them. They moved in. And then one of the kings, they were clearing out the old temple, you know, like their, their room over here that we need to clear out with all the junk in it. And the, and the room over there, and the girls, uh, the girls' room down there, down that hall. Oh, and then that room over there that has every, use it. When we start cleaning those out, well, they were cleaning those out, and they found a scroll. They opened the scrolls, and it said, whoa, 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 whoa. It does say that Danny Fenner owns this piece of property over here. We've got title deed to it. And it says the new owners went in and kicked the old owners out and said, you're not an owner. You're, you're a usurper. You're, you're a squatter. You, you don't belong here. Well, a lot of people think that this scroll, although it's full of judgments, so it's not just a title deed, because when we start opening these seals in the next few weeks, we're going to see their judgments. But it also has this notion of who really owns the world. And one day when he comes back, what he's going to do is when that, that theory or that theme is a better word of when Israel came back in the land, they took back what was theirs when they showed up again. When Jesus Christ returns to this earth and doesn't just call us out in the rapture, but then actually sets down on earth, I'm a premillennialist. He's not. <laughs> so I do. What? 
Yeah, he's he's a post. Uh, so so I had to squeeze that in there. But but anyway, I think I think my belief is when Jesus returns, he's going to say, "I own it, devil." He's going to give him by the scruff of the neck and throw him in the bottomless pit. After the devil praises him for a little bit, after he's after the devil says, "He that sits on the throne is worthy of blessing and honor." But what Adam lost in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect environment, look what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was squeezed, he was squeezed, that Gethsemane was a wine press or an uh, olive press. Adam had the perfect environment. Everything was good in his world. And he fell. Everything was rough in Jesus' Gethsemane. Remember, that's where Jesus said, Father, if there's, if, look, God, if there's any other way, if Michael can be slaughtered, if Gabriel can be slaughtered, if this archangel, if that angel is going to scream and yell, who's, if all those angels can be wiped out, let, well, let's wipe them out instead of me. If there's any other way, let's do that. But not my will, Father, thy will be done. Look what he did at Gethsemane. He took back what Adam dropped. And one day he's going to come back and pick up every deal, every problem, every sin you've been involved in has been done to you. Who believes we serve a righteous king? Who believes we serve a righteous judge? The three offices of Christ, priest, prophet, king, he's going to come back and he's going to rule all three of those. You know, without going too, we're not going to go another just a minute or two, but in political philosophy, you notice our founding fathers said we need an executive branch, someone that has the ability to execute the law. We have a judicial branch that kind of judges what's right and wrong, and we're going to have a legislative branch that makes the law. And the reason they did that in their documents, you read the extra uh, sources of our founding documents, they said, if all men are evil and they need someone to govern them, then how do you put someone in government that's evil to govern other people that are evil? And so our system, you maybe heard these things of checks and balances, they broke up those three offices and said, it's, it, you, couldn't, you can't give one person all those offices. It's too dangerous. It's too much power. So when it says here, who is worthy, I'm reading this, the only one that's all good, all powerful, all knowing, has perfect justice, he's the only one worthy for me to bow down to. He does it all perfectly. He's the only one. I would never want a man-made theocracy here on this earth. But boy, I'm so looking forward to the one that Jesus Christ sets up on this earth. All powerful, all perfect, all justice, all good, all knowing. There's no one else worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this message today, and we thank you for this revelation as you continue giving us more and more insight, not into the future, Father. Help us not to be focused on these scriptures as we want to know what's coming. We want to get closer to your son, Jesus Christ. We want more of a revelation of him. We want to know more about him, know more of his character, and become more like him. Jesus, we ask you to lift up our prayers right now before the Father, as we know you do. Your scripture tells us you do. Father, those that are hurting or suffering in any way, uh, Father, just comfort them today. Let them know our church, Autumn Creek, stands here to help them. Uh, we, we will do whatever we're able to do. And Father, we'll, we'll go to the throne in prayer. We'll ask for miracles if ne miracles are needed. Father, if there's folks here today with children or grandchildren that are in a tough situation or going through something, Father, we ask you to bind those demons, bind the devil. Give them sight today, Father. Send someone then to them. Help them to hear a word of mercy and a word of grace today that they might come to know you as their Savior. Father, we ask all this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, if we have a soft music to play as we do our uh, time of, in, uh, our time of uh, communion, I'll tell you what, we'll do the invitation song and then we're going to do communion. So if you don't know what we're talking about or you say, well, I know about Jesus and I've heard these stories and I know about Christmas, but I don't really know about this salvation stuff and about the blood and what are you guys talking about? I'm not asking you to join Autumn Creek or sign a pledge or do anything. I'm just saying, come to, come to know my Savior today. Come to know. If you're at home and you don't know what to say or do, you heard me earlier, just, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Remember me when you enter your paradise. Something so simple. Just, just kneel at the cross, either physically or in your own, if you're at home, in your own mind or in your own hard emotions. Say, just yield to, the, to Jesus Christ. Amen.